hear these words from the book that we love, the bush that burns and is never consumed. When Jesus saw the crowd, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to them and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people revile you or persecute you or say all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, it's no longer good for anything, but it's thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will be wiped away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches others to do the same will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For truly, I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard it was said to those of ancient times, you should not commit murder. And anyone who murders is liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. If you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. If you say you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on the way to the judge, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you'll be thrown into prison. And truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into sin. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. You've heard it was said that whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of unchastity causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be a yes, yes, or a no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who asks of you. Do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I say to you, love your enemy. And pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, 
What more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? If you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you are giving alms, do not sound a trumpet before you in the synagogues and the streets as the hypocrites do so that they'll be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be done in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to stand in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you pray... When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who's in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father in heaven knows what you need before you even ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not bring us to the time of trial but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites who love to disfigure their faces so as to show others they are fasting. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face and pray to your God who's in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not consume and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If the eye is healthy, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of of darkness. And if the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one, no one can serve two masters. A slave will either hate the one and love the other or to be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or worry about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not more value than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? So do not say, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles that strive after all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows you need these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is more than enough for today. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For the measure you judge, you will be judged. The measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice that log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, hey, let me take that speck out of your eye while the log is still lodged in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take that log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take that little speck out of your neighbor's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs. Do not cast your pearls before swine or they will trample them underfoot and then turn and maul you. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who searches finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. 
If you, is there anyone among you, if your child asked for bread, you would give a stone? Or if your child asked for fish, you would give a snake? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? In everything, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. There are many who take it. The gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves and you'll know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit. Every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Everyone who hears these words of mine is like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rains fell, the winds blew and beat against the house, but the house did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell. And great was its fall. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I wonder what is welling up in you after hearing the Sermon on the Mount. What response do you have to these iconic words of Jesus? Think about his parting words to his disciples. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, but the house did not fall because it had been built on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a fool who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and it fell, and great was its fall. Do you want to know how I respond, honestly? I wonder, how are these words really good news? Right before the Sermon on the Mount begins, we learn that Jesus has been traveling through Galilee, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Then he separates himself from the crowd, goes up on a mountainside, sits down, and his disciples, those who've responded to his proclamation and now need the good news of the kingdom unpacked, nestle in for some teaching time. What does it really look like to live as people of the kingdom? And at the end of describing in detail what the kingdom of heaven is really about, Jesus lays it down. You can't just listen to these words and walk away. You have to listen and act on them. Otherwise, you're like the foolish man with a house built on sand, and neither you nor your house will make it. Or as theologian Karl Barth puts it, to follow Jesus manifests itself in obedience. Faith and obedience belong together, as do thunder and lightning. Reflecting on the gauntlet that Jesus lays down here, one biblical scholar writes, the standard set is nothing less than perfection, being like God. The discourse is intended as a way of life, but only for those who are committed to the kingdom of heaven, and even they will always find that its reach far exceeds their grasp. So when I hear these words as a recovering perfectionist, I wonder, how do I receive these words as good news? How do I act on these words when the standard is nothing less than perfection and I know how far I am from perfect? Further complicating the picture for me, having spent years writing this book on justice and the Bible, 
I also listen and think, how are these words good news for me? And how are these words good news for people suffering from injustice near and far? I think about Bula. Bula lives in India. He took out a small loan to cover an emergency expense. He didn't realize that the people who made the loan with him never wanted him to repay it. They wanted to use the ruse of the loan to take him a thousand miles from his home and trap him in a brick-making factory. He worked 18-hour days under the hot, grueling sun, suffered vicious beatings, little food, little rest. He was the victim of labor slavery, a common-day form of slavery, a common modern-day form of slavery, all over a debt that was probably around 25 US dollars. How are these words of Jesus good news for Bula? Or I wonder about Kunti and Shanda, 11 and 12-year-old girls in Cambodia victims of another form of slavery, sex trafficking, sold by their mothers, held in a brothel, beaten if they tried to go outside, beaten if they cried while men had their way with them, injected with narcotics to blunt their resistance and their tears. How does the teaching of Jesus here connect to their suffering? To understand how the Sermon on the Mount is really good news, let's turn back to the Beatitudes. Today our focus is the final few Beatitudes. The word Beatitude is kind of strange to our English ears. It comes from the Latin for Beatus, used in the Vulgate for both Old and New Testament verses that follow the form happy are or blessed are, such as Psalm 1-1. Blessed are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. So Beatitudes are descriptions or commendations of the good life. And here in Matthew, Jesus is commending the qualities which promote the good life of the kingdom. So let's get a peek at that good life of the kingdom. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is subversive teaching. There's no doubt about it. Subversive, paradoxical, revolutionary, There is a reason the crowds were astonished. And yet, Jesus' teachings do not come out of nowhere. Teachings received up on a mountainside. Does that remind you of anyone else? I'm thinking of Moses, who went up on the mountain to receive and then deliver God's law. And here on a mountainside, Jesus takes some of these very same laws and helps us further receive God's intention for them. Jesus tells us he came not to abolish, but to fulfill God's law. So we should not be surprised that each of the words we see in these Beatitudes has a long and rich history within the Hebrew Scriptures. Today we'll focus on three, mercy, peace, and righteousness. Mercy. To be honest, this is a word I almost completely ignored in the Bible until recently. There is a description of God that runs like a refrain through the Old Testament. God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And these words point to one of the most stunning gifts of the Bible, God's hesed love. No English word can capture all that is meant by the Hebrew word hesed. So sometimes you'll see it mercy, sometimes you'll see it steadfast love, sometimes loving kindness. One biblical scholar beautifully translates it, God's love in action. So God's hesed helps us understand why God created, why God remained faithful to humanity generation after sinful generation, why God sent Jesus Christ. Because of God's hesed love, God commits to faithfully and actively loving his people. And amazingly, this hesed is not only a character of God, but it's a call for God's people. We see that today in Matthew. We also see it in the famous Micah 6.8. What is good and what does the Lord require of you 
to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. To love mercy, that is hesed. We are called to love and act in ways that reflect God's mercy. We are called to be merciful. Peace, shalom. This word we tend to hear more about, even in this chapel already this year. It's another Hebrew word that doesn't translate very well into English. It means peace, the absence of conflict, but also wholeness, flourishing, the vitality of creation. When everything and everyone God created is living together as God intended. God created us to live in shalom, and once that shalom was disrupted by the fall, God called his people to continue to seek it. We see this in Psalm 34, seek peace and pursue it. We are called to be the peacemakers. Righteousness, in our minds, not usually a positive word. Sometimes we get these images of self-righteous people who care more about following rules than loving others. This could not be farther from the biblical notion. You probably know that in the New Testament, the words that are translated justice and righteousness come from the same Greek. So whenever you see one, you can add the other to try to get the fullness of what was intended. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for righteousness is about relational faithfulness. God, creation, humans, living and loving rightly. A righteous person would be one living faithfully in each of their relationships, loving God, loving neighbor. So to put it all together, we're called to be righteous, putting God's merciful love into action as we seek God's peace and wholeness in this world. We're called to seek first God's kingdom and justice and righteousness. Now, reflecting on these verses from the Sermon on the Mount can feel like an inspiring call to live God's way of justice and righteousness. But for me, it can just as often feel like a prescription, what I need to do to get into heaven, rather than a description of what it looks like when the kingdom of heaven comes to us in Christ. So here's where we get to the really good news of the Beatitudes. Jesus came not only to teach them, Jesus embodied every single beatitude. From his material and spiritual dependence on God, being poor in spirit, all the way through to being insulted, persecuted, having all kinds of evil falsely set against him as he made his way to the cross on our behalf. Jesus turned the other cheek instead of striking back when he was arrested and beaten. Jesus went the extra mile when he went to hell and back for us. Jesus loved his enemies and prayed for those who persecuted him when from the cross he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So rather than receiving Jesus' teachings as a millstone dragging us down because we can't possibly be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, we can receive the gift of being invited into Christ's perfect relationship with the Father. We don't have to achieve righteousness because we've already been given God's righteousness as a gift. We've been restored to right relationship with God so that by the grace of God, through the power of the Spirit, we can seek right in this world. As beloved children of God, we have received God's shalom peace. We have been given God's hesed love so that we can be peacemakers and seek mercy in this world. This is good news for you and me. It's also good news for Bula and Kunti and Shanda. It was Christians seeking God's kingdom and righteousness who helped Bula find freedom from slavery. Having received God's love and mercy, Christians working with International Justice Mission put God's love into action. They used their gifts and training in law to seek the freedom of those who had been unjustly enslaved. It was long, hard, painstaking work. But with God's strength and perseverance, they were able to rescue not only Bula, but 513 other people enslaved in that brick factory in a single day. 
And it was other Christians with training in social work and psychology and education who helped care for Kunti and Shanda in an aftercare home after they were rescued from their brothel. They introduced these young girls to laughter and play and the freedom to go to school to have hope and opportunity. So my hope today is that having been made right with God in and through Jesus Christ, you too will offer your lives to seek what is right in this world. I hope you'll use this time at Biola to learn about the world through your studies, to learn about God's reconciling love for this world. I hope you'll use this time to discern how your callings might be used by God to put his love into action. This will not mean moving to India or Cambodia for most of you, and that's good. How will you continually discern right where you are? Where is peace lacking? Where is reconciliation not happening? Where are people not flourishing? And how might God be calling you in your jobs, your communities, your families, your neighborhoods, your towns, to be the merciful, to seek peace, to seek first God's kingdom and justice and righteousness. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.